and I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint. All right, I need a yes or no that you see this. I see you. Okay. Oh man, that was so much better with Coco in it. Sometimes it takes just a, a few minutes, or a few seconds. So you still see me? Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> All righty, here we go. It gets this tunnel. If I don't find this tunnel, then it, it doesn't work. But uh, yeah, I stopped sharing there for a minute to chat with you guys. So that's what happened. Um, there we go. Now I can see you. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, from the beginning, slideshow, stop sharing. No, nope, I want to keep sharing. All right, do you see that? Mass spectrometry. Sure can, yeah. Okay, perfect. So this is ILM 310404B. It's version 22 again. Um, mass spectrometry. Um, when we talk about mass spectrometry, it's an analyzer that analyzes um, mass to ratio for uh, molecules and compounds and things like that. Um, it's used for uh, basically hydrocarbon processing, this analyzer. It's also used for iron and steel production and uh, biotechnical applications. So it's it's got quite a range of, of uses. Um, it's a fairly short uh, IL, uh, ILM, so it'll be a fairly short um, lecture for you guys. So learning objectives here, there's only two of them. Describe the principles of mass spectrometry. And the second one, describe the application of mass spectrometry. So learning objective one, describe the principles of mass spectrometry. And it's a technique that identifies and measures atomic and molecular masses of atoms. So all of these atoms that we'll find and, and elements and molecules we'll find on the periodical table. And we all know that each one has a molecular mass. Um, so this is what these uh, analyzers do is they separate or they identify um, against known um, other, other compounds and other elements and other molecules. And it also does uh, the positive charges of the number of ions. And we make every one of these ions when it's going through this, uh, this analyzer to be a positive ion, and I'll show you how they do that. Um, it's gas mixture analyzers only. Um, so they go do a qualitative analysis, uh, anal, uh, analyze, um, analysis, I should say, and that's for qualitative is what's in it, correct? Identifying each compound in the gas mixture. And then, of course, you're going to do a quantitative, how much is in there. So the amount of each compound in the gas mixture. If I look on page two, mass to charge ratio identifies the original atom or molecule. The molecular mass of molecules is measured in atomic mass units, AMUs. And we all know that from third year. And then the mass spectrometry composition uh, measurements take only a few seconds to complete. So these analyzers are really quick. Once they, there's, they're under high high pressure vacuums and stuff like that. So once it's being taken or or the uh, uh, the gas sample has been taken into the analyzer, it, it, it takes only a few seconds and, and you've got uh, an analysis of what's in there. So we look at this, we said all uh, atomic mass units are found in the periodical table, of course. And what is atomic mass of hydrogen and AMU, atomic mass units? Well, you guys don't have a, um, you don't have a uh, periodical table in front of you, but you, if, if there's questions on it, you'll always be given the atomic mass unit. Um, there's very, very little math in this uh, particular ILM anyway. 
So we're looking at hydro, uh, hydrogen, and there it is on the periodical table. So mass unit, it's uh, atomic mass unit of 1.008 AMUs. Um, so we just take, say that's one. Um, what is atomic mass unit of carbon? Because that's what we'll be analyzing too. And carbon is 12. Um, when I when I make these into molecules, such things like atomic mass um, of methane, right? So here we got methane. We got uh, CH4. So for me to get the atomic mass unit of this particular molecule, I have to add up all the mass units. So if we look at uh, hydrogen as being one and carbon as being 12, we'll have a mass unit of 16 AMU. Now, uh, with these analyzers, atomic mass units, um, they uh, measure according to how, how, how much mass is in each molecule. Here's atomic mass for propane. So there's propane, which is C3H8. And of course, all I do is uh, count up all the atomic mass units of hydrogens and the carbons, and I get a AMU of 44. Now, as I say, there's no, you guys won't be using periodical tables, and there's not one on the test or anything like that. So they won't be asking you questions like this, but this is just to show you what we're measuring and how we're measuring them, uh, uh, dealing with the um, atomic mass units charge to ratio so this mass spec block diagram page three um, they're all pretty much the same uh, the iron source changes there's about five or six different types of iron sources and then the iron detection there's I think there's three detectors to, that we'll have to talk about um, you see a high vacuum system so um, the whole the whole um, analyzer is in a vacuum um, and then, of course, we have a data handling system, and, and it's, uh, that's going to give you a readout of, of what you've detected in your air or gas um, sample. Inlet system, again, that's, that's, your, that's uh, the system that dries and, and uh, um, dries the sample and makes it, and it also it'll, it'll actually um, take out any, any of the impurities and things like that. So when we start here with, with the system, it's a clean and dry sample. So it has to be clean and it has to be dry. And your sam sample system is going to do that for us. So this is where it goes in. <clears throat> then we go to the ion source. Now this gives the gas molecules a positive charge. And the way to give something a positive charge is to take away electrons. If you take away electrons um, from a molecule or atom, you're going to make it a positive ion. You're taking them away. And there's different ways to do that. And I'll, I'll explain that too. So it's uh, in your mass analyzer, the ion separator. It separates the ions according to their mass to charge ratio, which is mz. And weak electrical currents are detected by the ion detector and are amplified. Um, so what happens is these positive charges are considered to be uh, their small, small electrical circuits, and they're amplified to give you uh, indication of uh, what you just sampled. Um, the high vacuum system, as I said, keeps the pressure below uh, 10 to the negative 6 millimeters of, eight of um, mercury. So this prevents air molecules from interfering. One of the things when we start talking about these, and I'll show you how that we don't want any air in the analyzer at all, because it'll it'll uh, basically have make collisions with with the, um, the molecules that we're trying to detect. So we don't want any air in there at all. And the roughing pump. This roughing pump is just your normal pump. This is the pump that'll turn on when you turn this analyzer on. It'll turn it on and it'll take it down to 0.1 millimeters of mercury. Once that does, once that happens, then my uh, my high vacuum system takes it down to 10 to the negative six. 
data handling system on sources gives identifies uh, and it, it identifies the compounds and their concentrations. So basically, when we talk about this, this is um, this is the mass spectrometry, and there's different iron sources, of course, ion sources and different ion, ion detectors. But other than that, this is how it works. So on page four, you've got this uh, sample inlet and iron source. So we have the clean dry. We have the sampling system here, and it flows through like this. We have a uh, this is called a sample leak and i mean it's 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 kind of a funny name because you think it'd be leaking and leaking is not good but what it does it's it's got microscopic holes in here and so we can actually have molecules flow through here so as the as the molecules flow through um the sample molecules are drawn in to because we've made them positive on this this is an electrically heated filament and you have you have electrons that leave this and if they're they're negative so electrons are negative so what happens is when they're released here from this heated element they they are attracted to this positive plate and so these electrons they go up and they bombard the sample molecules removing electrons from them and then those electrons are caught up here and then they make positive ions because they've taken electrons away because they've bombarded them. This goes, and because it's a high vacuum, there's a high speed, and it goes these sample ion, these sl these split slits, and these are negative, so the positive obviously is uh, is attracted to the negative, and then of course off to the detector. So if we talk about this, the ion sources. So that was uh, how we, how we we're making ion sources. This is electromagnetic or electrical. This one, there's a thermal ion source, there's electrospray. So this is what I'm calling an electrospray. How I've made these into I positive ions is through electrospray. You have electron, you have a matrix assisted laser, and those those are all the, all the four. Um, we don't go into how they exactly work on each one of them. Um, all I'm telling you is that they, these are the four ion sources to make these uh, molecules into ions. So if there's ever a question asked, it would just say, okay, what are the four types of uh, ion sources in, in a mass spectrometry? So high vacuum draws in the sample. So um, it's pulling this, this sample in through here and through these microscopic openings and pushing them through here. High, high vacuum draws these through. Uh, as well as the, uh, the the negative voltage plates because they're positive ions, and this what this does um, right here it's called accelerating slits, so they're just small small slits and they fire through here and they gain speed, and the reason they gain speed is because uh, there's different types they they get thrown they get actually um, sucked into the uh, um, the detector. Um, when we talk about the uh, electrically heated filament there, we've got electrons from the heated filament are accelerating towards a positive plate. So there's my positive plate. And they bombard the sample molecules and knock off electrons, making the molecules positive. So the molecules come in here, get bombarded, and they become positive ions. The negative voltage slits attract the positive ions, which cause them to accelerate. And then off to the detector they go. So, as I say, mass spectrometry, all of them are are, are used like this. The different the different things that we look at for are going to be our ion sources, and then of course detectors, which we're off to now. So, mass analyzer, page five, the mass analyzer sorts the ions according to mass and sends them to the detector. The methods are fixed magnetic selection detector, def deflection, I should say, variable magnetic uh, sector deflection, and quadruple mass filter. So this is how they're going to sort them, is these three methods, and we'll talk about each one of these methods. Well, right, I forgot time to flight. So here we go. We got a detectors are a precise location so they can detect the different mass fragments as they leave the magnetic field. 
So because we're all in a vacuum here, we have the ion source, we have positive ions coming through here, and it's it's uh, they explain it in the book like they say like it's hitting a golf ball. So you hit a golf ball, it goes out, 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 and then it starts to come down. If your if your golf ball was different uh, masses or things like that, it may go further, and the lighter ones would wouldn't go as far. So this is what they're doing here. They're they're explaining that uh, to us. So we have the larger molecules. They're all coming at the same speed. The uh, the lighter molecules with the mass units are down here, and then they have detectors throughout. This whole thing is a magnetic field. So when these ions come into here, um, the mag magnetic field is set up, and these magnetic fields are set to uh, basically um, basically they're set so that they will be able to identify certain molecules. And we'll I'll talk a little bit more about that because uh, the other one we use it has has a um, a variable magnetic field. This this magnetic field stays the same. So when these ions come through here, uh, where's my air? ions come through here, larger masses will go further, and then they fall, and they'll they'll hit a detector, and then the middle one and, and the lighter ones with atomic mass units. So back in first year, we le we learned momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Well, the velocity is all the same, and the mass is going to be the only thing different. And, well, I'll, we'll get a different momentum for this. So momentum is equal to mass times velocity. The velocity of all ions must be equal. So when they're coming through this, these little slits, these negative slits, they're all the velocity is always even. So the, fi the fixed magnetic field pulls on the ions, and the mass of the ion is detected by how far they travel. And obviously, they, these are these are compared to a known uh, standard. The next one is a variable magnetic selector. So in this case here, my magnetic field here is variable. So now I'm only looking for a certain uh, ion on this one. These ones get attracted here and here, or they'll fall off, and they never hit the uh, they never hit the detector. So when I set my variable magnetic field to a certain magnetic uh, capacity, um, I'm looking for specific ions. So variable magnetic field pulls on the ion of choice. So when, when I have my detector set down here and I vary my magnetic fields, I'll only get the ions of choice to hit this detector. So it's dependent on the magnetic strength of the mass of the ion selected. Only those ions will be hit, will hit the detector. So, so far we went, um, and this is of course a variable. This one's a quadruple mass filter, and it is uh, run by AC, AC voltage. And it applies a direct current DC and high frequency alternating current between each pair of connecting rods or poles. So my ions are going through here, and depending how high I turn up my my uh, AC, it's going to it's going to attract certain molecules, um, and basically I can um, I can have different uh, vo uh, voltages in here to select different ions. So this is how it works. Smaller and lighter than the magnetic deflection units, so they're more popular. So increasing or decreasing the voltage allows the filter to choose which mass to ratio, mass to charge ratio ions um, to pass through the filter. And then the other filters will be caught by the filter. So depending on how much uh, increasing and decreasing my voltage depends what I'm trying to select as far as um, ions of choice. So, again, this is a specific for certain ions. Once I hit the detector, I, then I get myself a little bit of a current, which is all, always magnified. So, these mass spectrometers are smaller and lighter because the alternate, alternating current that produces the required magnetic field. 
So we all know how heavy magnets are. So those the first two are fairly, you know, fairly bulky analyzers or heavy. This is the last one is the time of flight. So in this in this case here, the ion source, whatever it may be, turns these into positive ions, fires it through here. The larger molecules or heavy ions take longer than the light ions to get through this particular one. So use the difference in transit time through a drift region to separate ions of different masses. So once those ma once those ions are, are, are come through the ion source and they're again under high vacuum, so they're being pulled in high speeds. Um, it separates the, the smaller ions from the larger ions through time of flight. How long does it take? There's no magnetic in here. They all come through, whatever, whichever ones we have here, they all come through and they just hit the iron at a different, they hit the detector at a different time. Since a spectrometer generates equal kinetic energy for each ion, the smaller ions have a higher velocity and reach the detector first. Again, getting back into first year physics, Kinetic energy is one half times mass times the volume uh, velocity squared. So not not a whole bunch not not a whole bunch of um, technical stuff here. It's fairly simple. These four. So when we talk about detectors, we have a couple types. Page seven and eight, the Faraday cup. Um, they go from zero. 0.1% to 100%. Electron multiplier goes from 0.1% to ppm. And this is our Faraday cup. So, so these are detectors. So once these ions come through, the ones that we have chosen, or if there's a whole bunch of detectors, um, like in the magnetic field, uh, for the first one we talked about, these ions come through, these positive ions come through, and hit the sides of this wall, and it's called the Faraday cup, and it loses electrons, and they become, or it gains, uh, gains electrons, and then they become either neutral or non-ions, so that extra electron starts to flow through here. So as soon as they hit the cup, these, these electrons start to flow here. Now, there's a small current, um, but we have to have this voltage amplifier here, so I've got current and I've got voltage, I've got resistance here, so I can figure out how much current that I actually have coming through because of the number of ions that are hitting the Faraday cup. Let's talk about that. Most common ion detector in process mass spectrometers. When the positive ion strikes the Faraday cup, they lose their positive charge. The freed electrons flow from the cup to the ground through the resistor and the voltage is measured and amplified. So basically this is telling us not what it is because we've already decided what it what it was going to be or what we were, we were analyzing, but this is how much. The next one is going to be the electron multiplier detector. So the positive ion comes in here and it starts bouncing off of off, off this and it goes down and loses loses electrons every time. And basically, these electrons uh, go to the detector, and we we have a current flow to ground via or by the amplifier. If you look at this here, I've got I got 2,000 volts between here and here. So when these ions come in here and they just bounce, 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 bounce as they go out, then you you can get a reading from that. So incoming ions hit the surface walls of the detector and electrons flow from the, the uh, special conductive surface to the detector. As the positive ions continue down the detector tube length, more electrons are released. And obviously those electrons are the ones that are going to go through our electronic, electronic circuit and be detect, detected of how much is there. The amplified current to ground flow is proportional to the positive ions entering. So if it's proportional to the, 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 the ions that are entering and we know what kind of ions are, basically this is quantitative, not qualitative. 
the high vacuum systems page 10 roughing pump that's the one that starts up first and it takes it down to 0.1 millimeters of, of mercury again you because of the ones that we've just showed you of the flight and all that kind of stuff and, and magnetic you don't want any air in there because you don't want these molecules to be bouncing off the air um, and, and these ions uh, bombarding the, the so we try to get all the air out and it, it does it first way is is the roughing pump again it takes it down to 0.1 millimeters of mercury and then the high vacuum pump removes the remaining traces of gas so the, these are typical questions right these pumps maintain pressure less than 10 to the negative six millimeters of mercury and the analyzer and detector prevent contamination of air molecules mixing with the sample molecules So this is the roughing pump itself. So um, when I first showed you the uh, the actual analyzer, it showed the roughing pump outside, and this is outside of the analyzer itself. So designed to quickly remove air from the mass spectrometer and reduce the pressure to about 0 0.1 millimeters of mercury. It's oil sealed rotary vane pump. And then the reduce reduces the pressure in the mass spectrometer to its operating value of less than 10 to the minus six. So that's the high vacuum pump. So there's a couple of them, turbo molecular, and they have an ion pump. So the turbo molecular actually spins. So I can see here there's a, the, the mass spectrometer and then the gas comes in and you have this, this is the spinning. Right, it shows you the rotation of that. And then it goes to the backing pump, which pulls it all out. Now exhaust into an oil sealed rotary vane pump, backing pump. And it, oops, oh, wrong way, sorry. Rotating angle blades force gas molecules through the pump and to the backing pump. So it's basically taking all the gas molecules and um, sending them out to the backing pump. And that reduces it down to, um, obviously, uh, 10 to the minus 6 millimeters of mercury. So here's an ion pump. And this thing is not, nothing moves here. So we've got these positively charged ions. And we have ions. And basically, all it does is take these ions to ground. The ionized molecules accelerate the molecules towards a metal plate held by a ground potential. So there's no moving parts on this. This is just, this is just a high voltage uh, a pump. And it's funny to say a pump when it doesn't actually have any moving parts, but it's taking all the ions out in the air, out everything out. So you got a, you got a plus five kV here. So 5,000 volts here, electron cloud, positive ions, they all go to ground. And then all they do is bleed to ground. No moving parts, just getting rid of all, all the ions. Several of these metal cylinders pull ions to ground after they are agitated by strong magnets. Moving electrons collide with gas molecules, turning them into positive ions, which are taken through the electrical path to ground. So as far as uh, measuring the vacuum, they have vacuum gauges and the mass spectrometer must continually monitor and maintain a high vacuum to operate properly. There's an ionization gauge, there's a thermal vacuum gauge. We and so we talk a little bit about this. So this is the mass spec, this is the ionization gauge. Measures uh, measures pressure by ionizing neutral gas molecules present in the mass spectrometer and then measure the current produced when these ions move through the device. So you can see here you've got you've got the electrons flowing up here. You got neutral gas molecules and positive ones. Um, there's a current potential here, so that it knows how much ions are there as far as the gauge being a gauge. All all of them these are a little bit of a, a current flow. So heat electrons accelerate to the positively charged electrode. 
They collide with neutral molecules, dislodging their electrons, making them ions. And these ions are attracted to the electrodes. The ammeter measures current, and of course it's amplified. The current is proportional to the ionized gas molecules. The thermal vacuum gauge. So of course, this is the mass spec and this is the vacuum. Hot filament, thermal pile, the readout, AC or DC power. Operated by sensing the cooling effect of gases on a heated filament. So the more gas you're going to have, uh, the, 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 the more heat that is left at the filament. Gases conduct heat proportional to the number of molecules of the sample. So now we're going to go on to describe the applications of mass specs. Um, these things here, the qualitative analysis application here, so this is the qualitative, what is in there. So um, remember we said it's zero to 100%. Um, the biggest peak is considered 100%. Um, and this is the mass to charge ratio. So all of these little guys here are indicating of qualitative what is in that sample. And the largest one is the mass to, mass to <clears throat> the charge ratio here is equal to 16. So this is a 16. So this would be methane. And again, these are these are uh, uh, these are compared to known substances. So the mass spectrum unique fingerprint is used to identify known unknown compounds. How does the biggest peak in fragments identify the unknown compound? Well, they they basically measure against a known mass to charge ratio. They are plotted and compared to already known plots. And this is how we're, uh, and the same thing as uh, chromatography. We did that with chromatography too, where we, we've got a, we got a, had a chart and we compared them to the chart and that was um, basically retention times there on the, on the chromatographs. These are a little different. These are mass to charge ratios. The biggest mass here of the compound, and they say MZ is equal to 16, and that's I think that's my thing. So they're like fingerprints of known compounds, what they're compared to, and then we just we can we can basically um, identify them. Okay, so this here is multi-stream timing. Again, we we can multi-stream uh, with these analyzers, which means we can take samples from many streams um 50 to 100 uh we, we have different um ways of doing this and i'll, I'll show you that but when we're multi-streaming we're, we're just sampling whole different streams so in this one here we have stream one uh so we call it data one stream two data one these are all going to the analyzer all these streams So the selectors themselves, manifold systems, 20 streams or less. So this would be um, a, a, a manual or, no, sorry, where am I going here? Right there. So this would be a manifold stream. So I have five streams here and they would change every 10 seconds. So that's what they say. Manifold streams uh, are 20 streams or less. Rotary streams are 20 streams or more. And we'll, so this here, You've got a manifold system and a timing system. Um, so again, we we have stream one that goes into here. Um, it's no different than we showed you with with uh, with these solenoid valves. Uh, black is closed, so the stream one is opened here. Uh, stream two is closed. Stream three is closed. It goes into here, and then it through a T. There's a bypass flow vent or return. To the mass spec. So condition sample flows into two directions to purge the loop. So this is where we're getting this purge in here. Oops. So not much to them. The next one is your rotary stream selectors. So in this case here, this is what turns, goes to all these different streams. 
this stays the same. This is stationary, this part. <clears throat> so as this turns, it just picks up different streams. And there's, of course, the, there's a computer to analyze how fast they, they, uh, they turn. So this would be 20 streams or above. Ports not uh, selected connect to a common waste header. So all streams flow continuously. And that's all there is on that one. They don't say much about these, but they're just telling you that there are multi-selectors. So process monitoring applications on page 19. Um, we talk about hydrocarbon processing. We talk often replace chromatographs used to measure carb, hydrocarbon inorganic gases and natural gas or refinery and petrochemical plants. The reason they do this is because of the speed. Chromatograph is quite a bit slower than these mass specs. Iron and steel production, they measure the gases above the molten steel for controlling the quality of iron and steel. Biotechnical measures concentration of gases above the liquid contained in fermenters and bioreactors. So there's some applications. Um, environmental applications. Uh, can sample over 100 points to protect workers from the following. Things like volatile organic compounds, VOCs and fugitive emissions. So there's some of the environmental applications for that. And it just shows you like a, a stream selector, uh, selected stream air in here. Of course, it's got the membrane here, which is the, the leak. It's got the VOCs that'll go into here and they turn into ions and go through the mass spec. No different than the ones in the front. So hazards, always read and understand the following in instrument manufacturer's instruction before servicing. So basically high temperature, we have high temperature, we have poisonous oils and mist from the pumps, explosive or toxic acid and where they're vented, uh, lethal voltages. Uh, one of those, uh, the, uh, the ion pump had 5K there, so that could be lethal depending on how it's handled. Parts constructed from poisonous substances. So in summary, the mass specs have a very fast analysis time. And they're using hydrocarbon, iron, and steel, biotechnical, and environmental applications. If fitted for a correct stream selector, they can analyze up to 100 different sample points. And they're talking about like five seconds a sample. So you can sample quite a few things. And that's it. That is it for mass spectrometry. So not a big, not a big ILM. Um, when you read through it uh, and do the questions, uh, it'll be a little easier to understand now that we talked about it. Any questions? Yes, Tim. Yes. Can we generate a negative charge for the mass analyzer uh, on your page five? You. You mentioned all those charges, the positive charges. Are we able to do the negative charges? Such as okay, are we able to analyze the chloride negative? On page five? Textbook. Okay. Yeah. That right there. And what was your question? How do we how do we are we able to generate the negative charge instead of a positive charge for the mass analyzer? Are we able to, are the mass analyzers able to handle the negative charges instead of positive? Well, the negative charges themselves, they will go to the positive plates of the ion source. And and so what happens is when they, when they uh, uh, for example, any of the ion detectors turn it into a uh, positive ion by bombardment and taking off electrons. And those electrons are just bled off through electrical system. They got a negative plate and a positive plate and they just they just fly off to the positive plate. Um, you can see that on page four, how they, how they have uh, electrons have, have been released from, um, this, is, this is electrical, uh, from that element, they're released and they're, they're drawn to that positive plate at high, high speeds knocking off other electrons which also go to the positive plate so that's how we get rid of those electrons is, is through that is the, through the positive electrical plate so what if we have a potential 
hydrogen oxide in the mixture materials. Um, how we are, how are we going to analyze or confirm if we have a hydrogen chloride in it? Um, well, well, again, it's it's um, it's not about the, the analyzing doesn't take a place there. The analyzing takes place uh, when it goes into uh, the detector, right? And all of, even if it's hydrogen chloride or whatever substance you're 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 making that a positive ion, and the way you're making a positive ion is is through the either um, we were talked about the thermal ionization. There's an electro spray ionization. There's all sorts of types of ionization, but all of these are to make uh, the molecule a positive ion, right? By removing its electrons, and then the okay. positive ions go to the detectors. Okay, so I saw you mentioned uh, methane in the example. I'm not clear about the ion source. Is that the equipment or is it just the ion uh, ionization or selection yes. source? Yes, it, they're, they're all, yeah, that's a good question because you know it, it just mentions them here. It doesn't tell you exactly how they work. The only one that tells you how they work is, um, is a heated filament. So that'd be um, the electron ionization. It only mentions that. The rest, uh, like there's a thermal ionization and electrospray, they don't talk about how they work or what they do. But in general, all of them take the molecule and make it a, a positive ion by removing the electrons. But it doesn't, it doesn't tell me, like on, on four, it just says the ion source. How do we make these ions? And it just... It blurps out uh, electro spray and matrix assisted laser absorption, but it doesn't tell you how it works. So I know, Tim, you have lots of industrial experience. So um, in this case, uh, since you already mentioned the methane analyze, can you give us a typical application to analyze the methane from beginning of the stream? pump from and extract the sample from the pipeline until you get into the sample system, then you analyze with your mass analyzer as a whole process with your okay. industrial experience. Um, with these, these are only gas analyzers. Um, they don't they they don't analyze anything but but gas, right? So, so my thing you I think you for example, you use the uh, mass analyzer to analyze the methane, which is uh, with uh, natural mass gas. Or, or, yeah, with uh, with uh, AUM equal to 16 in one of your chart. Right, right. So can so, you give us uh, the whole process or whole picture? How yeah, well they would work they, out? Yeah, well, they, for example, they would draw in some uh, natural gas. And when we do our natural gas analyzer, we'll do that. We'll do a chromatography, chromatography for that. Uh, you'll see that there's so many um, compounds or molecules in natural gas. And basically what they want to do with the natural gas is if you can clean it, so you get mostly methane. And in natural gas, it is most, mostly methane. But there are uh, gases in it, and if if those gases are poisonous or something like that, then we like to take them out. We scrub them. So the only thing I've seen them use on is 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 analyzing natural gases, and then finding out exactly what's in the natural gas through uh, qualitative analysis and then also quantitative. So that's that's what would be uh, they they draw the the sample of natural gas. Um, make sure it's clean and dry, and then fire that through the mass analyzer and mass spec, right? And then you can find out exactly what's in your natural gas that you're burning or whatever, and making sure that there's no, you know, nothing that's harmful or nothing that needs to be taken out before it goes into, uh, say, a burner or something like that. So when you extract from the gas stream, uh, how are you going to 
send this message to the ion selector. Does this come from the ion source? Or how are you going to take this out and generate a positive charge? Okay, well, it, I it, still it, miss the whole picture. Okay, so it's posing, it's posing the natural, uh, so let's just use natural gas, posing the natural gas, right? And through through the the leak the leak sensor there, which which is just microscopic, it pulls all of that into whatever's in that um, natural gas. It pulls those in. Now we have to. So now I have this gas in there. I have no idea what's in that gas. So now I, what I have to do is I have to turn all those ions and all well all those molecules into ions. So now I've got all these, I've got all, this natural gas is coming into my analyzer. I bombard it. I make them positive ions. So do you get that much? Yeah. Right. So I just, I just make these into ions. Then the, the, uh, the detectors um, either go through a magnetic field or uh, if, it, if it goes through the um, quadrupole, Whatever I'm looking for, I set that that uh, analyzer up to detect what I think that is in the um, in the gas sample itself, right? So then, I, and I can prove that those things are in the gas, whether it's because it's a mass to ratio, right? Mass to charge ratio, and they would fall on these different detectors. When they fall on these different detectors, where they're they because they're all moving so fast because of the of the um, of the vacuum, once they go into the analyzer, it's um, well. There's four different types of analyzer, but once they go into the analyzer, the analyzer um, knows what could be in there and has certain specific detectors for each one of these ions to fall on. Right. So then I can measure what what I have in that. So if I went back to if I went back to see uh, this detector right here, you can still see this, right? You can still see the slideshow? Yeah, yeah, everything's still up. Okay, so I'll go here. So if I look at this, and I'm going to go from current slide, this is the fixed magnetic selector deflection, right? So I know that this is natural gas in here because this is what I'm taking it off a natural gas line, right? Uh, it goes through here and is bombarded, and there's a high vacuum, so these ions are all traveling at the same time. When these ions go into this fixed magnetic selector, all of these detectors are sitting at the bottom of this, and so the mass to charge ratio, they'll fall out. They'll fall out at different times because it's, it's, it talks about the AMU and the size. So if I have methane here and something else here, pentane or whatever it is, it falls on these detectors, and that's how I determine what it is. Now, that's that's the fixed magnetic selector. If I go to the next page, which is page six, right, this is a variable magnetic uh, field. Now, I'm looking for a specific one in this case here. Uh, I'm looking for a specific ion with a mass to uh, ratio charge. So I, I vary my magnetic field to pick out a specific ion. The rest will be attracted to here or whatever. They never make the detector. So this particular one is very, very specific. So I vary my magnetic field to determine what I am looking for and see how much of it I have in there. The next one, again, is, is this the quadrupole. And all I do is increase and decrease voltage to select uh, the particular ion that I want. and uh, the ion that I want will go through to the ion detector. All the other ions will be will be attracted to this. Now we're talking molecular levels, right? We're not talking about like like a, a, like um, like anything that in liquid or anything like that. These these are just this is air and and ions. And then of course I think that is the last one. Oh no, this one's a time of flight. So again, I got my heavy ions. My ions come through here through ionization, makes them positive charge, and then they're accelerated through here through the vacuum. And this one, basically, the heavy ions and the light ions 
go to the detector. The detector gives me a readout of what I have in my, for example, propane, or if what I have in my natural gas or something like that. Does that help? Yes. And uh, I saw when you do the ion selector is based on the mass. What if it's a uh, isotope? In that case, um, how accurate it could be for the mass analyzer since you, in one of the slides you mentioned, could up to 0.1% to ppm. So what's the accuracy? And in this chapter, we also did not mention the calibration. Do we need the calibration before you use it? And how often do we need do the calibration if you need it? Well, okay. Those are good questions. One of the things that we, like, we don't sample something that we don't have a have an understanding what's going to be in it, for, for example, right? So we have an understanding of what's going to be in this gas. We have to because, we'll, I mean, we're analyzing for something. We choose the detector of choice. Um, if we want, if we want to, um, for example, on the magnetic, the fixed magnetic, all of those um, detectors are there specifically for what we're looking for. So we don't go in blind and say, "Well, I don't even know what I'm doing as far as analyzing this." We we always have a um, an understanding of what we're trying to analyze, obviously. And then we we just we just basically compare them to the to the known charts or the standards that they've done with other analyzers in, in a laboratory. So when we when we're analyzing whatever it is, natural gas, we know uh, we have a good understanding of what's going to be in there. So when we go through these these uh, mass specs, it just proves that they're there and maybe. Uh, at certain times, it would be other molecules that are more abundant than than the ones we want or whatever like that. And then we can do something with it. We can scrub it or we can make it more pure. But as far as accuracy, these are very accurate because we have specific detectors for a specific mass to charge ratio, right? And of course, these, these are all calibrated too. <clears throat> you calibrate it with cal gas and all that kind of stuff to make sure that your detector is working. Calibrations are a big part of any analyzer. So how and often do we need to calibrate for each um, usage? You know, they don't they don't say anything in, in these books, but so whenever you have an analyzer, uh, the manufacturer specs are what you're going to be looking at as far as how often you have to do, have to uh, uh, have to calibrate these. Normally it's every, well, I shouldn't even say that because every analyzer is different. So a manufacturer spec are going to tell you how often you should analyze or calibrate these analyzers. And they don't, they don't go into that in the books themselves. The ILMs, they don't even talk about calibration, but obviously we, as we know, we're instrument techs, we're going to calibrate and we'd calibrate to the manufacturer specs and I, every every manufacturer would be a little bit different. So in the sample unit, I know you worked in Sanko, in the sample unit, do you see those uh, chromatograph and the mass analyzer, they're all in the same unit or they break down in different sample units? Oh yes, definitely. There, We have, we have um, the sample shacks were everywhere. There are um, even some of them are taken on the top of the stacks. You know, we would take information from that. Um, all the analyzers are in the same room. It's impractical, right? Um, there are some uh, rooms that have different types of analyzers, but um, yeah, they're all over the place. Do you have any yeah. typical sampling joints, engineering joints, and we can uh, take a look at the reference? Uh, yeah, we um, we had we don't have a mass spec at the college. We don't we got chromatography we got we got different IRs and well yeah we have different we we don't have a mass spec in in the college. The reason I'm asking is that we learn all those small pieces or fragments. I want to put all those together by looking for the engineering drawings and link all those together and make sense. Yeah, well, yeah, you would, you would be, you, 
again, when, when you're doing using these analyzers, you know what you're analyzing for, right? And if it's off spec or something like that, then something has to happen. But yeah, we don't we don't have a mass spec, so I can't even show you one in at the college. But uh, um, that's one thing we don't have. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. You bet. I hope that, if there's any other questions, just email me or whatever, and I'll see if I can get to the bottom of it or whatever. But when we talk about um, these analyzers or anything, even PLCs in the course we can't be generic i mean we have to be generic so there's no like uh they don't put uh, certain uh, brand names of any equipment in in these uh, ilms because it, it's supposed to be very genetic right generic and not and not being able to um say just talk about andres hauser just talk about something like that we have to talk about the whole thing these are just how they work, oh, process of operation. Okay, I'll stop sharing this for now. End the show. There we go. And stop the recording.